Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Morris Federation online event. My name is Pauline Woods Wilson. I'm the president of the Morris Federation. And today we have Stephen Rowley, who's going to tell us all about giants and hobby horses and Morris dancing and who knows what else. So um, passing you straight over to Stephen Rowley. Thanks, Stephen. Jolly good. Oh, thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here. And uh, so is Coppin. <laughs> he loves an outing. He's, very, he's had a busy time recently, so he's uh, uh, um, uh, quite happy to do something from home for the moment. Um, one thing I can suggest is during the presentation, if you um, uh, uh, switch off your video as well, it might help with the um, uh, with some of the I've got one or two bits of video on here. And I know uh, people have bandwidth problems occasionally so that that's helped then you can switch it back on again at the end right so what i'm going to do is get straight into um should we switch on the screen yeah on the slides yeah yeah we're going to switch on the slides um <clears throat> so i think i think this is the one right you should be seeing my um dancing with giants and um, I can't see any of you. Hang on, let's see. Let me, where can I? Um, yeah, that's good. Good. Right. So Dancing with Giants. And um, uh, well, the element of disguise. <laughs> We're going to be talking a lot about um, uh, disguise. And uh, and uh, uh, this is a bit of a personal journey through the um, through the area of Morris and Giants and uh, hobby horses. Uh, I've been involved with um, all three for quite a long time. And uh, so I, um, I did a talk at Sidmouth last year on, uh, on Giants because uh, it was the return of the Sidmouth Giants to the, uh, to the, the, uh, the festival. And I brought um, uh, my giant down and we had a, we had a great time there prancing around on um uh, uh through the town so um yes so uh and um along the way we'll meet some of the uh some of the uh, uh beasts and giants that i have uh i have created over the years and uh, this was this was my first one in in thrup uh, in gloucestershire um but um, just a little bit of background on giants and where they come from and uh, what the context is. Uh, so earliest contexts, uh, or most of the early uh, things come from the Iberian Peninsula. And in particular, we have uh, this one from 1265, part of the Corpus Christi Festival in Portugal. Uh, we used to celebrate Corpus Christi uh, in this country pre-Reformation. But it's it's still a big festival in uh, the Iberian Peninsula and in uh, in Italy. And at this festival, uh, they had a giant, a snake, a demon, and a dragon, and these were all representing challenges that Jesus had to defeat. Um, and so it's quite a uh, it's obviously some kind of processional thing. With well, obviously could have been, but in the light of what comes afterwards, we think it probably was. And we get a direct. Um, uh connection to this in the uk and um uh, many years ago chris hutchinson's here uh and chris and i oh chris is still involved with reading morris and i helped sort of develop that and in um uh reading morris we were really looking to uh, recreate what morris might have looked like church morris the kind of morris that happened uh on uh, the feast days or the dedication days of the churches. And in this case, uh, the Church of St. Lawrence, the main church in the centre of Reading, on August the 10th, the, the feast day for St. Lawrence, 1513, uh, there was this record uh, in, the, in the accounts of the church, paid for a hoop for the giant and for ale for the Morris dancers on dedication day, threepence. Item paid to the minstrels for four days, 22p i think they got the minstrels got better play probably <laughs> than the morris dancers but still uh, so um yeah so we get uh and you get a number of these um uh links between giants and morris uh coming up and uh, i know mike Heen is here and he's he's the real expert on this having spent all his time trawling through the the uh, annals of the the reed database but uh you know you often find that uh 
references to Morris and other things, you don't get great descriptions of, you know, there was this procession with these Morris dancers and this giant and things. No, you get uh, items in the account saying how much was paid for painting the Morris dancers' coats or for, in this case, building a hoop for the giant. Um, and uh, so in the early days of, um, of Morris, uh, right in the early days, we get uh, a link to um, to some of the the uh, context in which giants appear. And uh, in particular, one of the early ones is uh, a reference to Morris dancers uh, paid for um, to appear. I think this was in the Midsummer Watch in London um and to be part of the worshipful company company of drapers element of the midsummer watch uh it, probably possibly people don't know but but in uh sort of the late medieval early renaissance times uh, big events were often um uh, the way they were organized was that the guilds the important guilds like the goldsmiths and the butchers and the drapers and the merchant tailors and things like that would um uh would all um uh, pay and be part of these big processions and uh so um you know this is a quite a common thing you also get lots of other things uh in these in these processions uh there's a particularly interesting one from later in um uh, well, you know, hundred more than hundred uh, about hundred years later, just a uh, Chester Midsummer Watch, uh, which clearly was quite a spectacular event with four giants, one unicorn, a dromedary, a loose, a camel, a dragon, six hobby horses, and sixteen naked boys, painted black as devils. They were. I'm I'm interested in the difference between a dromedary and a camel. Perhaps one hump or two. And it took us a while to work out what a loose was, but we'll come to that later. But this would have been quite a spectacular thing. If you've never seen a giant, you know, to have uh, one of these great giants coming through, but four giants coming through in a procession, they were definitely the biggest thing in town. And as I mentioned before, we find a lot more about these uh, from the uh, from the accounts. And in this case, um, we've got accounts showing how much was paid for different things. Uh, Buckram for the giant's hood, four shillings. But I particularly like Michael Lynch for cutting garnish whiskers and all the roses used in the work, 10 shillings. <laughs> um, buying, buying Buckram from the giant's whiskers. And uh, it's not all just very um, uh, boring accounts stuff. You do find some interesting little gems. And in this case, um, uh, the amount paid... Uh, John Wright, 30 diet, five days, chiding and brawling and hindering the workmen from the work, and also for fuddling and drinking whilst several other letters and mole stationers. Just nothing and worthily he declare it, naught shillings and naught pence. <laughs> um, so you do get little snippets of other um, other things. Uh, the, in the interesting thing about Midsummer Watch in Chester um, was that uh, it, it, it followed a bit of a... a a similar pattern to the religious uh, um, festival or the religious processions. So in its earliest form, just procession of clerics. And then there was clearly a parade by the end of the 14th century, um, whether that was this, this was a Midsummer's Eve, we don't know. But then by the end of the 15th, it was um, a watch on Midsummer's Eve. And then 100 years later, it was banned by the Protestant mayor. Um, and this, it, it, you know, relates to quite a few issues that uh, uh, affected these kind of events. And then it was revived by the next mayor, and then it moved to Whitchew, and it, all kinds of things, and then and, and they eventually abandoned and, and then revived in the 20th century. And uh, we see quite a lot of these things go up and down in their um, fortunes. And I was very interested in these because we find in these Midsummer Watch, particularly in London, there's loads of really good references to the, the Morris dancers and how they were paid and who they were, um, which guilds paid them. And I think there was one that, uh, report um, reading Michael Heaney's book here um, uh, recently where each guild uh, 
was uh, required to have a, a, a troop of Morris dancers representing them uh, and uh, leading them in their procession. And they also paid so much for taboras and things like that. And uh, so very interesting things. And, you know, I read quite a lot about these. And then um, in the year 2000, I was invited to um, Catalonia and attended uh, a, a festival for the pipe and taba, Festa del Flavio, way up in a mountain uh, uh, town in Arbusiers. And I saw, um, having having made a couple of giants myself, I was thrilled to find that uh, I was here amongst giants. <laughs> So um, yeah, this was a great thrill, and um, we went on a great long uh, procession around the village, and then we finished up in the town square where the giants danced. And the next year, they gave me the great honour of uh, playing the march for the giants around the town. So I was absolutely thrilled to do that. And since then, I've I've, I've had the uh, I've had the honour of uh, dancing some of the giants and being their musicians on, on many occasions, not just in Abusias, but in, in other places. Oops, there we go. Um, and uh, uh, one of the other places I go to is uh, Villanova Illegeltra. <laughs> And uh, this was part of a, uh, uh, their Festa Majeur, which is the uh, dedication day of the saint of the church in the centre of the cathedral, in the centre of the, of the town. And uh, it being the 200th anniversary of one of their pairs of giants, they invited 20 more pairs of giants uh, to be in the procession. And it was quite a spectacular procession, uh, huge fun. <laughs> uh, and it took forever, it took forever. Um, because not just uh, the um, uh, the giants, but they have all the other elements that we find in those Midsummer Watch uh, things. Uh, here's a mulasa. There are various kinds of, of horses, but here's a, a mule, a very Spanish uh, thing. And the dragon is, uh, can I get the dragon? dragon. Here's the dragon. So the, the dragon, this was the night procession, but um, the dragon is accompanied by the devils and uh, they're not naked. <laughs> There's usually more than 16 of them, uh, but they do have uh, the, the Los Diablos, the devils, and Los Diablitos, the little devils, and that's children dressed up. And the children only carry one firework each, whereas the, 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 uh, the, the full grown devils might have a candelabra with 20 fireworks on. Um, now I mentioned in the um, in that uh, Chester uh, uh, watch that there was a loose, and it took us a while to work out what a loose was. And a loose turned out to be a fish, a pike, in fact. And uh, we thought, well, that's a bit strange. I wonder what a pike looks like <laughs> in terms of a, 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 a processional item. And then, lo and behold. Uh, going through the uh, processions in in Spain, I came across many fish, <laughs> and they and they and they spout fireworks as well. Uh, but the other things which uh, relate to this, which also relate to our uh, festivals, uh, our midsummer watches, guild processions, and dedication day festivals, 
are um, things that look a lot like Morris dance. Bells on the ankles and, <laughs> and the like. Um, oh, and people playing pipe and tabba. And um, something that looks like uh, a maypole. This is actually called um, Balza Gitanas, and you can see the girls are, are dressed up as gypsies. And um, it's a processional dance. That guy in the middle carries the pole uh, with him uh, along the procession route. These processions last a long time. And, uh, you know, the whole town comes out to watch. And I think through that, we get a glimpse of what it may have been like on dedication day in um, in uh, 1530 <laughs> in uh, Reading, or perhaps the Midsummer Watch, that, um, you know, there was these processions with things like Morris dancing and uh, hobby horses and, um, and giants. Uh, I often visit Girona and... Uh, Girona has got a particular, particularly fine set of giants, and also these these heads, uh, which are, have got various names, but Cabezados is one of them. Uh, they and they're worn just on top of a normal costume, and uh, these were mentioned as far back as that thirteenth um, century Portuguese uh, um, uh, reference. In the middle of this picture, you see the eagle. The eagle is fascinating. He never leaves the town or the city. He represents the civic state of the people. He represents the people, but their civic status, I suppose. And uh, whilst the giants and the big heads and the looses and the, uh, the mules and things like that go and visit other towns and take part in their processions, uh, the, uh, the eagle always stays at home. So their context is a uh, religious play parades, mainly church dedication day, uh, patronal festivals, you know, and um, and they are often the biggest celebration in most communities. It is a proper proper feast of all. It's the feast of, so it's a festival, and it's a uh, it's a holy day, a public holy day, and in that town, their patronal festival is uh, a local public holiday. In the UK, um, up until the Reformation, we had very much the same kind of thing. Uh, medieval church processions, civic processions, like the Midsummer Watch, um, and some places, you know, there were there were May processions and things like that. And um and guilds themselves held processions. So guilds might be part of uh provide the the um the basis for uh, or all the elements of a, a major uh, church or civic procession, but they might have their own processions. And uh, we get this uh, situation that in 15th and 16th century, these were quite common. And then the Reformation came. They banned the, the church processions, but also they really put it about that if you were, um, you know, a uh, a, a goodly godly man then you wouldn't participate in any kind of uh, a frivolous thing like a procession because it's clearly a catholic um uh church uh um uh attribute um and in many places the processions stopped altogether but in other places they moved date away from the feast day uh, onto a, a a more secular day like midsummer's eve or something like that and uh it's really where we get things like Lord Mayor's Day procession, which still goes on in London. And talking of that, um, I'm quite, uh, uh, I think um, Lynn Wilson gave me this photo of, um, of uh, Gog Magog and Corinius, Corinius in London. And uh, these, there were indeed uh, a continuous line of giants in London. And uh, going all the way back to these early times, and uh, sadly, the uh, original giants were destroyed in the Blitz. They were in the Guild Hall that was bombed, and uh, and they were destroyed. So they have these new ones. Interestingly, they're made of basket work, and it was often the Guild of Basket Work me 
uh, makers that built the bodies or built the giants themselves. And there's still that tradition up until not long ago in, in Spain. Um, thinking of another giant here, I know we have um, Paul here. Is it Paul Sample? And uh, probably our most famous uh, relic of this period or remnant of this period is St. Christopher from Salisbury. And uh, um, you can just make out over on the left here, this strange character, which is a bit easier to see, um, is Hobnob. And uh, St. Christopher and Hobnob, uh, they go back a long way. I think uh, 1570 and 1572, uh, respectively, uh, for these being part of their uh, procession um, at the bequest of the Merchant Tailors Guild. And it was uh, the Morris dancers were already in place before we get any mention of the giant uh, and the, and the um, giant and the, the hobby horse. I think they date back to the 1560s. You know, you'll have to go and buy a copy of Mike's book, The Ancient English Morris Dance, <laughs> to, to confirm that. Uh, and we also get, interestingly, around the country, some uh, in churches, we have these giant uh, images of, the, of, of, of people, of saints and things like that. And here's St. Christopher in Cornwall. Um, near me, there is, a, there is a chapel. It's a very small chapel, but it has a huge St. Christopher painted on the wall. And also we have a record in Frampton on Severn near where I live, where there was a, uh, a St. Blaise painted on the wall. And we'll come to that in a little bit later. But um, whilst we're looking at, uh, at this, I, I'll talk a little bit about the hobby horses and uh, where, we, where we get them. Um, so uh, early on, uh, actual descriptions, there, there are um, descriptions going back uh, over a millennia of uh, traditions in some parts of the world where um, in the Kalends, uh, that's the beginning of January, a lot of people would uh, put on costumes. Uh, this, a lot of masking tradition come from that, that time of uh, that period and including um, uh, animal maskings. And they'd run around and act silly and uh, have fun. And there is a story about the uh, the, the little stag. And uh, our earliest uh, depiction of one of these is from 1280. This is from the Bibliothèque de Paris uh, library, really, um, uh, of a, a marginal illustration. Nothing about it in the text, <laughs> just in the illustration of, of the little stag we think it's the little stag uh, we think it's related to what we hear about that with a lovely bagpiper and you can see the face poking out of the of the costume and it appears to be a mast type animal that is a head on a stick type animal uh but um in uh another period um uh book uh, somewhat later uh the famous romance of alexander uh we get this marvellous illustration of uh, clearly uh, a, a three-legged stag uh, using the same uh, technique, the same shape of a person bending over and the head on a stick uh, forming like a, a one front leg, exactly the same as Hoodners do today. Uh, the Romance of Alexander um, is also quite famous for this image which uh, a rather poor copy, but um, perhaps I could I could get get a better one from the Bodleian Library. Um, but uh, which is always trolled out when everybody looks at the history of mummers. But there is nothing on this page or in the entire book that mentions mummers. It's just been ascribed to mummers, and there's no evidence at all. It's clearly some kind of uh, performance theatrical thing with masks but we no idea what it is and there's nothing per se to connect it to mummers that comes from the margins of uh, this splendid page um but uh looking at other um um uh beast early beasts the guild of st george parade in norwich 
that's quite an interesting one. The the uh, the guild was founded in I think 17, uh, 17, 1376, sorry, 17, 1376. This was after Edward III in 1350 created the Order of St. George and uh, sort of supplanted Edmund the Martyr as our patron saint with um, St. George, because Edward the Martyr was a meek and mild religious person, whereas St. George was uh, was a, reputed to be a soldier. And uh, he could his name could be invoked to invoke to spur on soldiers to defend England in battle. And the guild was founded 1376 and the beast was first mentioned in 1407. So this period, 14, 1400 is to 1500 is is the start of where we get a lot of uh, uh, processional beasts appearing in our records. Um, now, there's another element here, and uh, coming into the uh, 17th century, early 17th century, we get this uh, um, idea of uh, Morris together with the hobby horse. And uh, there are various uh, references to, to Morris and the hobby horse in the late 16th, early 17th uh, century. Um, have I, got, I haven't got the date right that. I think that's 1520, I think, rather than 1620, sorry. Um, but um, uh, the interesting thing uh, on this one is that it's a particular kind of horse we call a tawny horse, where it looks like the rider is riding the horse. And the the history of the tawny horse is quite interesting because tournaments were, from the 13th century, were a popular court entertainment, uh, and people got hurt and killed uh, actually poking each other off horses but then later in uh, a form of entertainment called pas des arms they would actually have uh, mock tournaments with mock tawny tawny horses tournament horses like this and so uh, they became a feature uh, well before the uh, morris appeared but by the time 1500 1510 that sort of period we start getting the Morris and uh, the hobby horse appearing together. And in the Betley window, we get um, uh, these other characters as well. The Maid Marian, Friar Tuck. It, it's the um, Robin Hood um, story. And uh, in the 15th century, uh, we were getting the St. George procession but also a May, uh, a Robin Hood procession. So these were sort of legendary type processions that were happening at different times of year. And uh, particularly at May, having the Robin Hood procession. And we then get Morris being attached to that tradition in particular. So it's Morris has got various things as a courtly entertainment, as a civic procession, as a church procession element. And then it gets... Uh, attached to this interesting um, uh, May tradition. And uh, there are various records like this in Plymouth. There's quite a lot of records of of civic payments to the Morris, and then ones like, and also paid to him that played upon the hobby horse sixpence. <laughs> and this continued in the 16th century, and this connection was quite uh, quite clear in um, 1583, uh, was it Sir Hubert Gregory went to America to set up a colony and included in uh, in the in the party uh, for the solace of our people and allurement of the savages. We were provided of music in very good variety, not omitting the least toys as Morris dancers, hobby horse and the may like conceits to delight the savage people whom we intended to win by all fair means possible. And we all know how that ended. Um, now, um, I'm going to leap back to my uh, involvement with um, with with hobby horses and giants and things. And um, my uh, introduction to hobby horses was with the St. Albans English Folk Packet and uh, uh, and Billy the Goat here. Uh, the goat, Billy the Goat was uh, so uh, named. He was, um, uh, the reason why they had a goat was that the leader of the group, the guy who set it up, 
he actually lived in the goat pub for part of his life, early life. Uh, Billy was uh, often uh, uh, danced by my brother Damon, my late brother Damon. Damon was six foot seven tall. And this goat, <laughs> as you can see, is quite a lot taller than those ladies. Uh, uh, I think they're in Germany there. And uh, he was um, uh, uh, quite a, quite an imposing sight when he came prancing around the corner. I remember once we went into, we were, we were traveling to Switzerland and we we went through Heathrow and I had Billy as hand luggage in a black plastic bag. And as I um, uh, I got pulled over by security, pulled me over. <laughs> there wasn't any x-rays in those days or anything. They just pulled me over and said, what's in the bag? So um, I opened the, I sort of put the bag on the counter and was opening up. I said, Damon, <laughs> that's my brother, come over. And Damon put his head into the bag and then reared up and I pulled off the bag and there was this nine foot of goat peering over the security guy <laughs> he jumped backwards and then waved us on and we went on and Damon went careering through um through uh, duty free <laughs> into the departure lounge so that's how I started and uh, I was I think about 16 when I first 17 when I first got involved in Billy um but I went on I did a degree in sculpture later on and um uh, yeah, got into the business of making horses, and I was commissioned to make Blanche, the Banbury town horse. They're um, uh, uh, beautifully ridden by Stephen Buss, and uh, that's a, that was quite a major horse. And that was built for the first uh, hobby horse festival uh, in Banbury. I think that was in the year 2000, somewhere about 2000. It was at one of those, I think 2000, 2001, that I met the Hoodners. And as I mentioned, the three-legged horse here. Uh, isn't it, isn't it a, a pity that um, in those days we didn't have such high-resolution cameras on our phones? Uh, but still. And uh, I really got interested in the Hooden horse, and um, they, let, they brought several of them down, and I was able to photograph them inside and out and look at their mechanisms. And um, in 98, 99, I think it was. Yeah. And so in 1999, uh, I was asked by our Morris side to make a horse for our uh, newly revived Mummers play. And that is when I decided to make a hooden horse style thing called Coppin. And there is Coppin. And he's a very naughty boy. And he's had quite a life. He's continued to have quite a life. He's been on tour with Eliza Carthy. He's played the Royal Albert Hall with Trembling Bells. He's on various music videos, mostly courtesy of Alex Merry of Boss Morris. And uh, and he even appeared at the Brits a couple of weeks ago. So um, he's basking in the limelight of Boss at the moment. And uh, But he, he gets out and he does all kinds of things, uh, dancing abroad, uh, uh, out with Morris, doing mummers, out with um, all kinds of things. And... My work looking at the hooden horses, I realised that that could be incorporated in the work I was doing to uh, promote mummers plays in Gloucestershire. And I had a big grant from uh, Barclays that enabled me to uh, set up a project with schools and take the mummers plays back into the villages, into the schools, the villages where they'd been collected. Uh, so I did... Um, about a hundred of these <laughs> in over a period of about six years. And uh, I know Hazel is here. She, 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 um, in the, in the, in the talk this afternoon, she uh, was my accomplice on many of these and uh, we made loads of them. Here's a little batch of them <laughs> and uh, each one individual. We start with the same idea. In fact, these days I tend to start with a broom and uh, the one at the back here is made on a, on a broom base and uh and a pair of shoes so uh just uh, looking back at here uh copping the ears are made from a pair the uppers of a pair of shoes the lips are made but from the heel band around a pair and then these eye um eyebrows were made from the from the eyelets and then a couple of old belts and uh a bit of string and a sack and and a pole really a broomstick uh anyway I, I did lots of things with the uh with the Banbury 
group and was making horses and repairing horses and repairing dragons and all kinds of things. And it was back in, I think, 2015, 2016, 2016, I think it was, that uh, Ian Anderson brought uh, Alex, myself and um, Corwin and Kate and Steve and Carmen Hunt together. Um, and uh, we uh, came up with the shape of the uh, Sidmouth Horse Trials or the Hobby Horse of the Year show. And uh, this was uh, this was the 2016 uh, lineup. <laughs> and what a motley collection there. We have um, we have all kinds of kinds of beasts. Uh, there's um, uh, there's a cow. There's two sheep. There's a little deer, uh, a Mary Lloyd, uh, um, a, a rat, <laughs> a minotaur, <laughs> a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> um you name it uh you, we we are never surprised by what turns up at uh the hobby horse the show this happens on the sunday uh of the of the sidma folk festival in the afternoon down at the ham and uh, it just gets bigger and more surprising every year really in what what happens we have a great time and uh there's uh julian and laurie down there um uh uh, they help to uh, uh, judge the event, as does Janet, who is here uh, this uh, this afternoon. And uh, yeah, we have a great time, and it's it's one of the bigger public events at the thing. And people come down just to take part in it and to win the great prize, which is uh, uh, donated by Peter Lord of Ardman Animation. So. Um, and that's taken me on to lots of other things. So I've made a number of um, uh, Mary Lloyds and uh, this thing, which is the broad. And the broad is sort of equivalent to the hood and horse and the Mary Lloyd. It is uh, it was a tradition, a way sailing tradition uh, beginning of the year. Uh, they would go around and sing their way sail song and uh, take around the uh, the broad and uh, there's some conjecture that it might be that this broad is like a bull and think some of them looked more like a bull were really to show that you were genuine farm laborers from the area and not just beggars <laughs> uh, and uh, and worthy of uh, contributing a few pence for for singing the uh, the Waysail song and um, yeah we have great fun going out with uh, uh, Coppin and the broad and I think that's Alex and Aaron there. <laughs> performing with them right um now i'm going to jump back to giants giants and uh some of the um uh giants in england so giants as i mentioned they sort of died out they had their ups and downs during the the renaissance but uh they mostly died out by the end of the 17th century uh although i think the lord mayor's giants did carry on but you know then then world war ii and, and those giants were destroyed so uh bringing back giants there's there was quite uh, there's been a re quite a revival over the years and i'm just going to bring out some of those ones that people might not be familiar with i know we've got janet dowling here a member of the grand orders of geysers or gog as it's called <laughs> who uh built uh, uh three very important giants and uh here we go with uh, Bertilac the Green Knight. So based on uh, you know, ancient stories, Gog Magog was huge. And I don't know how many people it took to um, to manoeuvre him, but uh, perhaps Janet will be able to tell us that later. And that sort of spurred on, uh, there was quite a movement. Uh, there was, uh, as well as the Grand Order of Geysers, Geysers there was the British Isles, Guild of Giants or Big, <laughs> and uh, so they were really out promoting building giants. And uh, one of the ones that got built in this period was Nathanriel in 1985 from Huddersfield, and he's still very active and a fantastic, um, fantastic giant. As I mentioned, uh, a Big brought a number of giants together, uh, Sidmouth and. Um, uh, particularly run by Derek in Dorchester. And uh, I think this is Caroline, is it, from Dorchester? And 
uh, on their books oh, during that 94 to 2003 period, there were 64 giants. But sadly, not many of those exist at the moment. Oh, many have gone, but some there are some others that have been uh, built. Uh, one of the places where um, there was a quite a revival was in Manchester, and I found this image on the on the net of um, of uh, giants from uh, a festival in 1994. And in we talked earlier about the Midsummer Watch in Chester, and there was uh, has been a revival of that. Uh, and uh, here are some of the giants there. And there's a there is a, a a giant arts company that that makes giants of various kinds and uh so you know they have all kinds of uh community arts projects around the midsummer watch now in 1992 there was uh the student games in sheffield and uh, as i understand it barcelona uh presented uh sheffield with two giants and uh, here they are. I think they're War and Peace, I seem to remember. And uh, they continue. And I believe Sarah is in the audience here and she'll be able to tell us more about those. But uh, yeah, quite splendid and uh, actually made in Catalonia, uh, made in quite a, uh, a famous uh, workshop there. Uh, during the um, there was a whole period of new town building in Kent and um, a lot of money got put into community projects to build communities in those new towns and uh, a scheme came up to build giants and so uh, there are here is a, a lovely uh, group of giants which um, uh, were built in uh, that early 20, 2000s in uh, I don't know how many of them still exist but I know the one on the right Flora the singleton giant is definitely still with us and she comes from ashford and uh, there she is and we've we've met flora uh now um giants uh, have had quite a, a a mixed life a mixed history in in the uk but abroad there's there are continuous histories ath is well known for its giants and giants are a big thing in ath <laughs> Uh, and uh, Belgium is quite good for giants generally, uh, uh, mainly the, the Catholic cities in jail, Belgium rather than the Protestant ones. And uh, they also do hobby horses on a grand scale. Uh, I, I love this one. In, um, in northern France, uh, uh, there are quite a number of uh, cities which still have giants i saw one picture where they had over a hundred giants together around the town square so uh, you know giants are still big things but they are huge giants the giants i'm used to are the are the little giants in the middle <laughs> they're still 12 feet tall <laughs> but those huge ones are ridiculous uh here's a an image from uh one of the the, the big gatherings of giants at sidmouth uh i think the one in there is grandfather in the middle and then the sound reel on the left and far left is caroline but i don't know the others but uh sidmouth has uh currently has giants and uh if you go to sidmouth folk festival on the saturday you will see them out there dancing uh through the through the towns in the morning and uh, sabra and george and last year as i say um blaze and this is blaze blaze was uh, a community project i was asked to take part in or to <laughs> to, court, to, to to set up in 2013 and uh it was 2015 by the time it, it got um uh actually you know the, the the actual event ran and it was to celebrate 700th anniversary of the dedication of the church as I mentioned before, there was a giant St. Blaise painted on the wall of the church up until the sometime in the 19th century when it was painted over. St. Blaise was revered um, because his patron saint of wool workers, and it's a very much a wool area. And in the whole of the Stroud Valleys area, St. Blaise's Day, February the 3rd, was a public holiday. 
and in Frampton on Severn, they had a fair. This went back to the 17th century. Uh, in later days, it was known as the frying pan fair. Frying pan fair actually died out um, as not long after the First World War. So we decided to uh, recreate a dedication day procession with all the elements that we could find <laughs> uh, that would be relevant. So we had Morris dancers and hobby horses and a giant and a loose <laughs> Siglo, the Frampton salmon. Uh, he wasn't a, he wasn't a pike. Uh, there was a tradition of salmon fishing in, in Frampton. So we decided a salmon would be our ideal thing. And um, we based this idea on this lovely little uh, uh, illustration from the English Bible in Toulouse, of all places. And uh, I just love that, uh, love that little um, uh, walking fish there. So, uh, yes, so now every February the 3rd or the nearest Sunday, usually, uh, Blaze uh, comes out. He does a little procession in the church with the beasts. Um, we've got a lot of beasts now in Frampton and a little group of dancers and a group of musicians and singers. Uh, it's a jolly affair. We eat pancakes and drink cider as well. Uh, so here's a little bit of that. Uh, whoops. So there we are. Um, uh, we have a tawny horse there ridden by the Lord of the Manor, <laughs> the Squire of Fram Frampton, and we've also got the Seven Boar. Um, so anyway, that that's the tradition that continues there and good fun. And the group now is called the Seven Blazers. So there we are, um, uh, uh, Alex and myself at um, uh, Arbusiers, um, uh, dancing with giants, and we thoroughly enjoy uh, uh, gianting uh to this day and i can't I, I find it quite difficult to dance a giant these days but i do like to play for them jolly good brilliant so who's got um we'll have a applause at the end but who's got uh, is there anything in the chat Stephen? oh i don't know no 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 not everybody the was um yeah too bored <laughs> yeah, they couldn't find the button on the screen. Couldn't find so, the button. Yeah. Yeah. So, who, if you'd like to um, ask a question or uh, share something, if you'd like to press um, under reactions, raise hand, and uh, we'll see. Hello. Yes, and please I'm put your videos back on. Please yeah, put your videos good, back on. Otherwise, we feel lonely here. We do. Stephen, do you want to take them or do you want me to take them? Oh, have we got have we got any? Well, we've got we've got some got raised two. hands. I, yeah. I'm trying to find the um try and find the raised hands. Wow, there we go. So oh 700, 724, 2999. Who's that speaking? Yeah, that's Steve. Hi. <laughs> I'm just curious what the giants are made from and how heavy they are to operate. Uh right. Well. Uh, I do have images of the interior of giants. Let me, um, let, I, I can show you that, actually. Let me just um, end the slideshow. And where is it? Um, I have got images. Uh, it's quite interesting to see the inside of giants. And I've, um, let's see if I can find an image to show you. Right, jolly good. So, um, 
let's share screen again. Right, share screen. If I can open this one. Um, right, let's move that across there. Sorry, moving stuff around. Right, share screen. So here is, um, uh, so this is a traditional uh, wicker uh, basket maker's um, uh, approach to it. And uh, there's another one there. The heads, they cast originally from um, something called carton, which is glue and wood sawdust, really, and then painted. But now they're cast in fiberglass. Um, uh, they're immensely heavy. So uh, I've danced traditional ones in uh, Spain and we're talking 12 stone, you know, they are very heavy. As a porter, you dance just for about 20 yards and you swap over. Uh, you know, they're very, very heavy. Um, I made ours a bit lighter. Uh, there we go. So ours is made of we're just putting it together there but it's made of um uh aluminium uprights and a little you know, a little bit of wood structure uh shoulder pads you carry them on your shoulders and the head we made out of a much lighter process uh which is a model as is a is a technique uh which uses loads and loads of bubble wrap basically molding bubble wrap is our method, <laughs> um, which makes it quite repairable. <laughs> now we've got, oh, I've got Mad Bess. Where's Mad Bess? Otherwise known as Liz. Hello. Hello, Liz. <laughs> Hello. I can name most of your Sidma, the, the, the picture of the Sidma lineup. Oh, right. I can name most of those giants for you. Uh, well, marvellous. What we ought to do is we were th talking about should we be building a new directory of giants? And I think uh, Janet here uh, has been uh, looking at that. And we have a there is a there is a, a Facebook group, isn't there, called Dancing with Giants? Yeah, uh, you've you've got four hardcore gianters here. Yeah, so you. so yeah, I I figured that, and uh, you'd be the experts on that. So uh, I think you know it'd be really good to get that uh, directory going again, you know, and and build that up um, because you know otherwise. Uh, we lose giants, you know, and uh, that's that's a sad thing, you know. So, um, but um, yeah, yeah. The other answer, to, the other other thing, the answer to um, the question, what are they made of? It depends what you can get your hands on. A lot of the Spanish ones um, were made of wood, not wicker, so they had yeah. this wooden bar stool arrangement. Yeah, it, it's it's yeah. what we refer to as the bar stool arrangement, where you've got the long legs into a frame yeah. with yeah. more frame above that but that's what makes the spanish ones so much heavier because their legs are wood yes and, and well, some really of them, solid and, <clears throat> that's right foundation. some of them are very very heavy heavily built um and but i found some of the wicker ones very heavy as well you know i mean some of them are very old and the, the fact that they've been able to keep them going for 200 years is amazing well, that's what happens when you have the catholic church behind yeah. you. <laughs> that's right that's right sarah now the sheffield sheffield oh. giants <laughs> hello sheffield city giants can you hear me yes we can hear you lovely okay two things well more than two actually <laughs> they're made in they are made in the catalan style and they have a bar stool that the porter carries. Uh, well, we call it the bar stool. It's basically a frame with a pad for the head and pads for the shoulders. The body is a carton pedra, which is a form of cardboard. You can buy it in sheets if you happen to live in Catalonia. <laughs> it's the um, nearest thing we managed to make is papier mache. Yeah. Uh, also, the giants were built in 92. The Student Games Festival was in 91. All right. And at the very last minute, um, Joe Henderson, who was running 
the Cultural Festival for Student Games, got in touch with some Catalan giant makers. And they sent across the giants from Manresa, two of the traditional giants from Manresa. And they also had the giants belonging to the Agrapassion in their charge, they being um, work and culture. Very, very beautiful giants. They came and I'm sorry about the dog. They were so pleased, so pleased with the hospitality they got, they actually said, would we like some giants in Sheffield? And they were part funded by the Cat Catalan government, excuse me, and part funded by the Agrapassion, the Catalan collection of giants. And our giants, War and Peace, came out in 92. Yeah, they're marvellous, absolutely marvellous. I've only seen them a couple of times. Um, I, I was a, a friend of Jerry, and uh, yeah, so Jerry, Jerry, Jerry was a great help to me in building this. <laughs> Unfortunately, Jerry is no longer with I us. Know. I know, it's so sad, so sad. The yeah. giants are actually in abeyance at the moment. We've been rather badly hit uh, by the pandemic in terms of illness. Quite a few of our people are not able to actually turn out for any length of time. So I'm afraid we're trying to rebuild the group now. So if anybody lives within the striking distance of Sheffield, get in touch. I think that is a, a, a continuous problem for giants, and it has been a problem for giants in the UK, is that we don't have, <clears throat> um, it's not a, a well-known thing and so it's 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 you know it's definitely well off center and uh, people don't necessarily identify with them as they do in the towns where they are established in the, on the continent and uh you know I, when i'm in uh, uh sort of I, I do a lot in various towns in catalonia but i for instance in villanova il Geltru, they um the agripasio um there for the for the ballad populari um they coordinate the whole procession and they help to uh each different group and in particular the giants to keep their thing going but the giants group there is is a massive group uh to support i think they have i don't know some i think they might have six or seven giants and uh to keep those giants running they have a very large group of people fundraising all year round selling t-shirts uh all kinds of things and bringing on a continuous new supply of fit young uh porters to to yes. to dance them because in a procession that takes you know four hours or something like that you need to keep cycling over the the porters every few minutes so they're only dancing for 20 yards, then they change over a new new porter and so on. Yeah. Yeah, so, we um, managed latterly with uh, four. It was hard four. work. Yeah. Six, eight is better for War and Peace. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we got Lucy. Lucy? And she's she muted. Hello. <laughs> All right, am I, am I unmuted? I think I am now, yeah. I'm trying to put my hand down. There we go. <laughs> um, I just wondered if anybody had any pictures or would show me uh, the undercarriage of their horse because um, I'm struggling with my frame for mine so I'm using an old I'm using a hula hoop um, but I, it's just yeah I, I, I've been trying to uh, work out how you kind of fix fix the head to the front and then oh, counterbalance right. it yeah. so I just wondered that, if you had any uh, I haven't got any well I might have some pictures here I, um, I might have but um I've taken apart a lot of traditional horses, including Hobnob um, in the museum in Salisbury to look at how he was put together. Yeah. And I used that as a basis for working on, on Blanche, but there's quite a heavy horse. Yeah. Um, whereas, um, you know, that if you look at something like the Yardley Gabion horse or the, um, uh, uh, the Abbots Bromley, they are more of what we call a riddle horse. Yeah. where an old riddle frame is used as the as the as the yeah. as the ring that the, the rider stands in and that's much more substantial than a hula hoop yeah. uh, but um other cheesy comestibles are available but <laughs> but um 
uh but i did uh uh i've got a lot of photos of of uh horse in uh barbados um called the steel donkey and um, interesting thing in barbados they the mummers tradition was taken over to barbados by the indentured servants uh in the early uh, 19th century and they didn't have a lot of the things they used to make the horses out of so they made it out of fencing wire and mm. coated and made um, and everything including the head and yeah. and everything was fencing wire and then yeah. and then uh you know skirts and things cut up to make all of the the coverings yeah. uh so um yes yeah, so I, I can certainly uh give you some help and advice on there on the on the design of a a, a hoop <laughs> oh yeah that horse. yeah that would be lovely but yeah um the because i think i'm doing quite a lot in that i want it to collapse so that i'd have to carry a great big carry hoop big around. hoop around yes yeah and, so and... it's a collapsible hula hoop that you can kind of click together yeah, like yeah, old yeah, yeah, tent yeah, poles yeah, yeah. um i think one of the fun money. things <laughs> one of the fun things about the steel donkey is was you, you could just squash it <laughs> yeah well, yeah that's it, it yeah because i've done ideally i'll be able to get on a bus with it and then i won't have to drive <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> no so that's all, that, that, all engineered so that i can have a pint i don't know if um i don't know if matt simons is here but he and i were discussing about taking a uh, picking up a hobby horse and carrying it on the um uh, on the train but <laughs> I, <laughs> I think yeah, i've done yeah. a morris i've done a morris tour in a horse on a bus but <laughs> but um, no and i understand that thing and yeah i've got I've got um, various beasts here. One of them is the Bow's horse, which was made in the uh, originally made in the fifth, uh, 1950s. Uh, substantial wicker construction. Yeah. Very robust, but yeah. quite a yeah. weight, yeah. and yeah. takes up takes up all the boot of my car. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wicker one would be nice because, but yeah, I think after after this, it'd be nice to do a more. I'd like to do a more sort of traditional one, but uh, I'm yeah. trying to make a kind of. Uh, lighter version of gary that i can kind of yeah carry about but then oh, yeah. it has yeah. to it has to swallow money it has to um do uh, all those things yeah. yeah but yeah i'll give you a bit of a look i've been working on it while we're here so there's my hula hoop yeah and there's the front of sort of yeah. front of gary there or gloria as this one's going to be and that's the hula hoop there that kind of all intersects so i can take that apart um and then it's going to kind of feed through the fabric like you would feed a tent pole through brilliant and then yeah. that's hopefully going to hold it all up with a like a tabard and it all just goes on yeah. over the top so yeah um yeah. but yeah if i could if i could harass you at some point for some please please do um, that'd be lovely yeah. um uh uh we can sort of communicate through um pauline there on that now yeah. i've got a, i've got so questions and <laughs> janet is the next one with her hand up you're missing john oh am i missing john all right yeah no, all right john's got <laughs> John's hand is very pale. Let's it is, John but first. He's, yeah. he's there. Yeah. Lack of vitamin D. Oh, right. <laughs> so, sorry about the pale horse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just, 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 one, email. just one point about the previous question. Uh, Notty is actually uh, based on an uh, aluminium strip, which is fastened around the front, and uh, the head screws on separately. That sounds like an engineer solution there, John. You're dead right. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to comment, please. Um, Rob Chisman. Um, I'd like to comment about the St. Blaise Giant. Now, mm. when we moved to Cornwall from Leicester in 1965, we moved to a, a town actually called St. Blaise, and it was the church of St. Blaise. So I knew all about the face of St. Blaise on February the 3rd. Absolutely fascinating. I'd love Steve, if you could send me a few uh, photographs of that so I can uh, take them along to the church next time I go on. Um, the other thing I'd like to um, promote, if I may, is anybody that's on this Zoom uh, with a giant or, or just with a horse or anything like that, are cordially invited to the next convention in Brighton, uh, 27th to 29th of October, I'm going to post this onto the uh, through to Pauline so she can put it onto the Federation website or whatever or newsletter or whatever. Um, as it's not until October, so you've got plenty of time to consider it. Uh, the cost is just quite simply eighty pounds. We have had a chance to put it up, but I still think it's a darn good um, uh, cost. That is for indoor camping. If anybody wants to stay at a bed and breakfast or whatever, that's entirely up to them. Um, it's um, we've got. Uh, workshops on the Friday. Uh, we've got 
um, a tour on the Saturday, followed by a feast, uh, ARM on the Sunday and possibly another workshop. Haven't sorted all that out yet, but that is uh, being oh. just launched out this week at the ARM. Hence, that's why I'm staying here <laughs> with John for a few days. Could you, could you put the, type some details into the chat? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll send it on the post event email anyway. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. So everyone will get it anyway. But, but if, yeah. if All right. Put, okay. If you put the dates in the chat, then people uh, yeah. will get that. Yeah. We'll um, do. Yeah. Um, um, and I've got I've got in mind um, Paul Sample wants to say something in a moment about what's happening in Salisbury. We'll, we'll come back to Paul after we've gone to Janet, and then I've got okay. Emma on the on the um, on the list. Hiya. Just hello, to say Janet. hello. Um, pleased to see that uh, the giants are around. Uh, Liz and I worked on them, or oh, rather Mad Bess, as she seems to be now. <laughs> <laughs> worked on them many years ago. Uh, yes, Gog Magog came out in 1985 and um, was retired probably around um, but about 10, year, well, 10 years later, I suppose. Um, just to let you know, Gog Magog was carried on the shoulders of 10 people it was the equivalent <laughs> weights of two rucksacks. So imagine a 38 pound rucksack on your front and a 38 pound rucksack on your back. That was the equivalent weight that people were carrying. Um, there were 11 in the portering crew uh, because the 11th man would sit stand in the middle of the framework. And then he had a clear vision uh, through the front and there would be somebody in front. And that was quite <laughs> often me. Um, who would be the person guiding the giant um, through, through the town. I saw a lot of Europe walking backwards. <laughs> um, I'll just let you know a uh, couple of things here. Sidmouth pictures, I was lovely to see the pictures of the giants in Sidmouth. That actually was my photograph. Oh, um, I, 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 I stole lots of photographs off the internet for this. <laughs> yeah, that's mine, my photograph. And, and uh, like Liz, I can name all the, the uh, giants, two of which were actually Sidmouth-based giants, the two crazy ones. And just recently I tracked down the person who had made them at that point, neither of them existing anymore. Oh. Um, for those people who don't know, in terms of Bertie Lack and uh, Morgan Le Fay, which is, was our London giants uh, from the great Grand Order of Geezers, they, um, uh, Bert, Bertie Lack, the Green Knight, came out in '93. Uh, Morgan Le Fay came out in 2000. We sadly had to retire them by 2004 because we didn't have enough people to carry them anymore. Whereas originally we could probably call on 200 people. Um, and uh, they are through, they've been various, they have always been on display, apart from the three years when they sat in my garage, but they've been in display both in France, up in Shropshire. And they're now moved to Ath, so they're in the Museum of Giants in Ath. So you want to see them? I'm afraid you have to go over there, but then you'll see all the other giants. <laughs> and I just I've just worked this out, Janet. That's 54 stone, Gog and Gog Wade. Yeah. He was bloody heavy. Um, and we learned a lot from that, which is not <laughs> too big with big, big giants. <laughs> My goodness. Um, anyway, oh, just, just uh, Great Fire in London. The last carrying giants were in the Guild Hall and got burnt in the Great uh, Great Fire of London. And Christopher Wren, when he built, rebuilt the Guild Hall, rebuilt the giants as statues. And oh. they're the ones that got burnt again in the Great Fire of London, which is why you've now got the ones that they are in there. And just to mention that the Bayard is not a hobby horse or a turny horse, it's a giant one at least. Uh, but the Bayard represents uh, it's one of the, one of the great tales of Charlemagne, and it's the sons of Amon, and the great Bayard comes in and rescues them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's a wonderful story, and I'll maybe tell it to you one time. <laughs> oh, I look forward to that. <laughs> and I, I did. Um, I, I, you know, it would have got too oh, long, so, but yeah. I've, I've got some lovely video of uh, hobby horse dances in Spain. Uh, they have tawny horse dances, which are just wonderful. Um, I've got a sorry, question. I'm from... Sorry, I, can I very quickly say, yeah. you said about the Giants list. Um, some of you will have come across Tristan Sedan, um, who um, is, is a giant fanatic. Um, he and some others have written a book about the Giants of Europe, very passionate about Giants all over the world. He has a list at the moment of all the Giants he's tracked down in, in the UK. 
I have a copy of that list. He's doing an update to it. And once we've done that, um, Steve or anybody else here wants to be involved, uh, we go, would like to work on that to then start contacting and networking with everybody to pull it together, just as you said, to yeah. maybe have something like big or something similar. Yeah, if, if it's, even if I can just put together a website, uh, your directory of giants, you know, that would be a start, wouldn't it? <laughs> okay. That will do. Thank you very much. I'll be on to you. <laughs> no, that's the sort of thing I can do. So um, uh, we've got Emma. Uh, I don't know whether you want to, Emma Wooders, do you want to go on to the microphone? You say your video is not working. Um, Hi, it's Paul Sample. Yeah. Well, oh, oh, yes, Hello. Paul. I did say come to you. I'm down to 4%. So. All right. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm gonna, well, definitely. I'm going to get my is yours, if Paul. I can. Uh, welcome from Salisbury. Um, I, I've been trying to get uh, Christopher back into our civic life in the city and have managed to do so with the help of Sarah Morris this year, uh, last year, uh, and we, we've had him out a couple of times. The It's a replica version which was made by students about probably something like 25 years ago. I've also been working with the museum at Salisbury and, and uh, I know the director, Adrian Green, is very keen to get him the original Christopher out into the community sometime this year because they're doing a major rebuild uh, of the museum, uh, the, the particular gallery where he is. So they're actually going to be able to liberate him, which is which is wonderful. I love the idea of, of some form of circular or email list so that we could, the directory, so that we can all talk to each other. I do feel quite lonely at times. Um, it's it's quite a, a strange group of individuals that we've got here, but we, we're we all pretty committed to doing this. And, and sometimes it would be good just to be able to get in touch with other people and say, hey, I've got a problem, you know, with this. How could we do that? You know, have you experienced this? Um, I think the answer to the, the volunteer issue is that the more you get, get them out into the community, the more people see them. You know, it's a bit like a rolling stone. It will gather some moss. And, and certainly by having him out over the course of the last uh, last year we've we've certainly drawn in a few people to do it wouldn't be possible without the help of Sarah Morris who'd been keeping him you know looking after him over the course of the last 25 years we have got one big event coming up this year which is the um, dance uh, festival um, which is Sarah Morris are hosting again this year in Salisbury Cathedral I think it's the 7th of May and we would be delighted. I know they all would be delighted to see um, more Morris dancers there next year. And if you want or have a, a, a giant and want to bring them on the 7th of May and have a gathering of giants, that would be brilliant. Um, but I know a lot of people will be already committed. So that that date is the 7th. Did I say the 7th of July? 7th of I think it's the 7th May. of May. Um, but anyway, have a look on this Sarah Morris website. And, and thank you very much to everyone for all the work that you're doing out in the communities, you know, around Britain to, to keep this wonderful thing going. Um, I, th I think, I think we are um, with COVID behind us and everything. I think, you know, the, the only way is up. Yeah. <laughs> a COVID proof giant. I I'm very pleased to hear that. I, I, w I did an a artist residency in Salisbury back in, Oh, I can't remember a long time ago, um, uh, working with Salisbury Museum and Wessex Archaeology and English Heritage. And part of the residency was in the museum and part was at Stonehenge. Yes. And uh, so it was it was great fun to be artist and resident at Stonehenge. But what thrilled me most was actually being able to play with with Christopher and Hobnob and to find out how they put together. And um, and I have been looking at I had been looking at the time about how he could be um, uh, uh, made usable again because the yeah. current framework is not a is a dem is although it's built quite a long time ago the framework is not a a performance framework it's a no it's not i mean yes. i've been inside that christopher in the museum with the permission of of uh yeah. the director um within the last couple of months and um it's a wicker construction mm -hmm. um and and you can lift him yeah um but but he tends to he tends to lean quite heavily to the left when you do that, and I think in a storm uh, or you know a heavy wind or, or yeah. even after rain, it, it would be quite a task for for one yeah, individual to carry. Him. It is possible though. Yeah. Um, it was made by we'll um, get... a coachmakers, wasn't it? There's a little little label on it. The coachmakers who made the who made the structure. Um, didn't I, see that all right it's but, quite interesting. But, but yeah after about five minutes my my face was so full of dust <laughs> and the accumulated 
uh, detritus of, of many of many decades. So he's been in there sort of, I think probably since the new museum, the, the you know, it, it, yeah. the, the Christopher moved from the old museum to the new museum probably about 30 years ago. Hobnob's also, um, there's a replica of Hobnob now, now which, which we are using. My wife um, is operating him and other, other Sarah Morris dancers have operated Hobnob. And actually Hobnob is seen more because he's easier to carry and put in the back of the car. Whereas, you know, the Christopher re replica is, is much more difficult. But um, anyway, enough about Salisbury. <laughs> Make a date in your diary. Please come to Salisbury and, and uh, get involved in the in the Day of Dance. Uh, as I said, it's the 7th of May. Yeah, marvellous. Well, thank you for that, uh, Paul. And not just the end of uh, last bit of Salisbury, because um, Salisbury has been on my mind recently because a long time ago in the 1970s, there was an exhibition of uh, folk costume at, at at Salisbury Museum and it was the last major exhibition of that until this year and so if people are interested now we've got two amazing exhibitions that are on at the same time I can't believe it you wait 30 years 40 years 50 years you know and then two come along at once so if you haven't already been go to Compton Verney um, which is near Warwick and uh, there is Simon Costin's marvellous exhibition and then also the Hoodner's um, Hooden Horse exhibition at Maidstone Museum. And uh, that's also got one or two other uh, horses in it, interesting horses, not just Hooden Horses. So um, both of those, absolutely fantastic. Um, I've got the catalogue, a copy of the catalogue for the Salisbury Museum, which was a, a, was a larger scope than either of those other two. And um, if with you... It, with your refurbishment going on at the museum, maybe it might be possible for Salisbury at some time in the future to host another museum uh, uh, exhibition, uh, which would be something. Let let me have the details and I'll pass it on to the director. So, yeah, perhaps um, perhaps uh, Pauline could put me and Paul together on that. Right. Okay. Um, we've got a question from Emma. Are you on the microphone, Emma, or just um, uh, you say you're. No, I can't. It might be Jameson. It might be James. Well, it's all oh, right. Could be Jameson. It's both <laughs> of us, but we're being assailed by a toddler. So, um, <laughs> oh, we can watch of... that, can't we? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but at the risk of, I'll, I'll try and be quick before she makes too much extra. There we go. Um, so, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, good. that's fine. Uh, the questions we had were regarding. Um, the movement from uh, over the Reformation from Catholic uh, England to, to Protestant and whether we see vestiges of some of those gianting traditions and gianting processions in things like um, the Guy Fawkes effigies if you think about the size of them in places like Lewis and you get that parading effect especially with the, the, the dragon you showed with all the fireworks going off very reminiscent of that kind of thing um, but also the Jack in the Green characters that you see um, in Whitstable notably um, thinking about uh, A the size of it and B the method of carrying and processing whether is there some link in your mind about whether there might be something between them well i think the thing is to to have a look at the at, at the history of those you know I, I i don't know i've not done any sort of work on on the history of those in particular but um they as far as i remember the jack in the green most of those traditions are well mike mike heaney do you know <laughs> jack in jack in the green processions when did they start according to roy judge whose bible is the only source on this really um they first emerged i think late 18th century mm. sort of developed out of the milkmaid garland ceremony which was more carrying silver plate about your person and then in some obscure fashion which i think isn't evident it morphs into more of a jack in the green carrying greenery and uh, but that you know there's no evidence of that until the late 18th or early 19th century I think um but I mean, I'd have to pick up my copy of Roy's book to check on that so do go and read Roy's book if you haven't already and uh, yeah, I think it's available on eBay places for some fantastic price at the moment it's, it's out of print sadly rest yeah. assured if it exists somewhere it probably exists in Jameson's library so I shall go <laughs> in there <laughs> investigate the back room thank you and, and do we have anybody here from the firework bonfire societies 
can't see anything. I thought there might have been, you know, because um, because uh, you know, I, I actually uh, uh, they uh, I didn't mention Hastings because Hastings has a uh, uh, in their Jack in the Green procession is one of the best gatherings of giants uh, uh, around at the moment, and uh, and Blaze has been over to take part in that, and we meet up with Nathaniel and meet other giants. It's it's huge fun. Um, I don't know about the guy guy Fawkes um, that history, but uh, you know I get the impression that you know the Reformation did for a lot of traditions and uh, and uh, really was quite down. The fact that Morris survived, I think, is fantastic. But uh, you know, a lot of these things uh, were were severely um, uh, uh, you know uh, hit by that. Um, just looking down um, uh, the list. Uh, Got about seven minutes left, and you've got yeah, three, Gin three Ginny, hands up. Ginny, 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 and Alan. Hello. Um, I wanted I asked those questions about weight and frames and what have you. Um, the will you please make your conversations with with Sarah about no who was it who we discussed making them can you make that public can you send right. it to someone because I've been trying to find out about making a tawny horse for years and oh right you're you're just telling us how to do it <laughs> um, I, I will say I discovered two things out of necessity um my ones where someone stands underneath them the not too big ones I use tomato frames put the put the head on build it around it and then you put your shoulders right in the frame and it makes it really easy. And last year, no, I guess pre-COVID, I was given, I was asked within a week of a production to, somebody made these fabulous, somebody who's done it professionally, these beautiful heads for giant animals, which were made of, um, I think, balsa wood and rice paper or something like that. But they only gave us the heads and they had to be in a show. And somebody said, well, make them into giants. All I had was bamboo poles. So I sort of laced together bamboo poles and balanced these heads on the top and people carried them. But it was like, how the hell do you do that? And, you know, if you can give us that kind of information, it would be. Fabulous. All right. OK, yeah. Um, well, I have been um, uh, asked about uh, doing another series of um, hobby horse making workshops. And I see Alex is down here <laughs> and she's saying, I've got excellent. a video of those workshops. <laughs> we have actually done photographs of how to make a hood and horse. And, uh, and we have the kits. So they're all bits of um, uh, the broom heads that we get direct from the broom uh, <laughs> factory without, so we don't have to pull the bristles out. And and because ah. uh, they're getting better at nailing the bristles. But did, but still. did you notice my, my hedgehog? Is actually an antique broom with all the bristles <laughs> sticking up. <laughs> oh, that is brilliant. That is brilliant. Um, yeah. So uh, we'll see yeah. what we can do there. Um, but I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any more questions in the uh, in the list there. Um, I did want to mention yeah, a couple, brief... couple more, Stephen. You've oh, got... right. OK. Oh, yes. We, uh, <laughs> I didn't know whether your your hands were still up or gone or, no. or not gone down. No, going gone back up again. <laughs> Liz. You're muted. Liz, you're muted, you Liz. 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 Liz, you're muted. Liz, Liz. you're muted. <laughs> you're muted. Sorry, did you not get that? The first, Pardon? the first Salisbury replica weighed a ton and was on wheels. The second replica is the one that goes out now, and they learned a lot <laughs> in between the making of them. Um, and also, as regards making a giant frame, I the the organisation Big, as Stephen mentioned earlier, um, we actually published uh, a newsletter that had instructions on making giants. If I still have it, I will fish it out and and um, I can put it in the um, Dancing with Giants page or something. That'd be brilliant. Put it online on if we get this pay this group communication <laughs> thing together um but we discovered early on that if you use bamboo poles you get a really whippy effect 
and if they break, they splinter and they are really sharp splinters. So using bamboo is not a good idea. And the third thing, uh, for making your um, hobby horses, talk to someone who makes bustles because the construction of a bustle or a crinoline is very similar to how you might want to put your horse's skirt together. Great, great. Thanks there. Um, and Sarah, you still got your hand up or? Yes, just very briefly. Um, bonfire and giants. Oh, that was it. Were you actually uh, thinking about giants in the current day bonfire or in past bonfires? You'd have to ask um, Emma about that. I don't know. Uh, she's looking at the history of whether there was a link that went all the way back. As far as I'm aware, not. I come no. from Lewis, by the way. Because uh, I think um, there was a bit of a break, wasn't there? Um, yes. Uh, yeah. And I think I think it's like a lot of these things, as as Mike said, there's there's these breaks. Um, I wanted before we switch off to say um, just to reinforce those those things that are coming up, that there's Compton Verney um, exhibition on at the moment. Maidenhead uh, Ma Maidstone Museum exhibition on at the moment, and there's some events coming up associated with that. Uh, the Hobby Horse of the Year show and um, Hastings and 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 also the Day of Dance in Salisbury. Uh, there's the, you know, there's quite a lot happening uh, if you want to see giants and experience giants. And if anybody wants to get in contact with me about making hobby horses and uh, making giants, uh, that would be great. I'm, yeah, um, always, uh, always ears for that. Brilliant. Thank you very, very, very much, Stephen. Sounds like a lot is only the beginning of some discussions about making animals. So could we all unmute ourselves, please? Give me a couple of seconds to do that. And then we'll give Stephen and Rowley a round of applause. Oh.